Hey internet, it's your old friend Dominic here with the All American Casino Guide, and today we're gonna to be talking about poker. Now there are many variations on the game of poker. There's five card draw, five card stud, seven card stud, seven card draw, Omaha, spit in the ocean, but today we're gonna to be talking specifically about Texas Hold'em, as it's quickly become one of the most popular variations on the game and has worldwide appeal, um, and you'll pretty much find it in most modern casinos. So after watching our video, you'll hopefully understand the game, the basics, and hopefully have a better understanding of how you go about winning it. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the number of players. Now, uh, like any game of poker, Texas Hold'em could be played with as few as two players, but in my opinion, the game gets more interesting the more players you get around the table, and in any tournament scenario, you're gonna see anywhere between six and nine players, as well as a dedicated dealer, who is not actually playing, but just simply overseeing the game and making sure everything runs smoothly. Now, Texas Hold'em, like any game of poker, revolves around a number of betting rounds um, that culminate possibly into an actual showdown where players will reveal their hands. Let's go ahead and delve a little bit deeper into that. This video is more of a beginner's guide to the game of Texas Hold'em. Uh, so what we're gonna be doing here is talking a lot about the jargon um, and the various phases that go into any hand of Texas Hold'em. Uh, most of the tutorials that I found out there kind of step over this, and I think that makes the game a little unapproachable to the uninitiated. So hopefully um, we're gonna go through this and you'll understand the game a little bit better. Okay, so first and foremost, let's talk about any given uh, hand of Texas Hold'em. So as I said, there's one dedicated dealer. Um, if you're playing amongst friends, one person will just simply take the role of dealer and the dealer chip will get moved around the table in a clockwise fashion. But uh, with each round of Texas Hold'em, you're gonna have what's collectively known as a small blind and a big blind. Now these are the players that are directly to the left of the dealer, and then the, uh, that would be the small blind, and then the big blind is the player that is directly to the left of the small blind. Now these blind players have to put a bet into the pot or the collective uh, the collection of chips in the center of the table. Um, this bet is arbitrary and it depends on the stakes of the table or what level the tournament currently is at. But for the sake of simplicity here, we're just gonna help go ahead and say that the small blind is $25 and the big blind is 50, all right? So the dealer, after the uh, small blind and big blind bets are already in the pot, is going to deal two cards face down to each player. Now, I'm gonna assume uh, for, the, for this example, there are five players at the table, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and put those five players out as such. Okay, try to get those in shot, all right, great. And then I'm gonna go ahead and deal like, a second card to each player. Now, these cards remain face down until the very end of the round. And the only player, and, and only the player can look at them. All right, so you can peek at them as much as you want, but you wanna be very careful not to reveal your cards to anyone else because that would give them an unfair advantage to know what you're holding. All right, so this first phase is called the blind phase, all right, where we we're working off basically blinds, okay? You're working blind with just what's in your hand. So uh, the, the small blind and the big blind are already committed uh, to the pot, as I've explained. Now, the player directly to the left of the big blind now has a tough decision to make. They have to look at their cards and they have to decide based on the strength of those cards if they want to match bet the big blind, if they want to raise the big blind and actually bet more than the required amount, if they or if they want to fold their hand. If they fold their hand, they decide that this hand is very weak and not worthy of the bet that is required to play it. Um, so if they wanna fold, they'll push their cards towards the middle of the table, uh, signal, signaling the dealer that they wish to fold their hand. A fold is a surrender of your hand, so you are no longer participating in this hand whatsoever. The other option is what's known as an all-in bet. Now, an all-in bet is kind of the highest tension mark moment in any game of Texas Hold'em. 
because what happens is a player literally bets every dollar they currently have, all right? So all their chips get shoved towards the middle of the table. This is an all-in bet. Now, other players have to either match that amount of money with their bet, or they have to push in all the chips they have if they have less than the all-in bet of the player to their uh, that just made the all-in bet. It's very high stakes, it gets really crazy, um, but going all in uh, in the blind round is a real gamble and I highly recommend you never make a move like that. Um, so after this third player has decided if they want to call, meaning bet as much as the big blind, raise, add more money, fold, or go all in, there's the next step is to continue around the table uh, going clockwise to this next player who does the same, and then again, the same, and then it goes back eventually to the small blind who will be required to decide if they want to put the other half of the bet in, because remember, they've only committed $25 out of the $50 big blind. So this player has one last option to decide if this hand is strong or not. If it's strong, they'll match the bet or they could potentially raise, or potentially go all in. But if they don't want to put the other $25 in, using this example, their option, of course, is to fold, pushing their cards towards the middle of the table. The last player to act will be the big blind, who has, again, one last option to raise the bet. If the big blind raises the bet, then we go into another round of bets where people will have to decide to match the bets, raise the bets, fold their hands, go all in, so on and so forth. But once, all, once the money at the table is all good, um, then we move on to the next phase, which is the flop phase. So let's just assume for this example that two players fold their hands and this last player went ahead and matched the $50 bet and the big blind went ahead and, went ahead and uh, just said to roll the cards. Now, in phase two, we then have what's called the flop phase, or flop round, okay? So the dealer will always burn the top card of the deck. Don't ask me why, it's just some sort of strange tradition or it, it aids in the randomization of the game. Um, and then they will put three cards face up simultaneously. This is collectively known as the flop. Now the flop is a communal pool of cards. This, These cards in the center, this is a communal pool. So any player can use these cards to make their best hand possible. And then later on in this video, I'm gonna explain the hierarchy of hands. But for this sake, we're gonna look at these three cards. Now, betting goes around again, starting with the player to the left of the dealer. So this player has the first option. Now, in this round, they have a couple of new options. The first, of course, is they can fold their hand, but it's really foolish to, to fold your hand without a, uh, if there's no bet actually required. Um, they can make an initial bet. Um, typically the bet required is the big blind, so they'll be required to make at least a $50 bet um, in order to bet at all. They can't bet less than that. They can bet more, but they're usually required to bet at least the big blind. Um, so for the sake of simplicity and argument here, we're gonna say that this small blind player right here has made up, has matched up some cards or they have a real strong uh, blind hand so they're gonna go ahead and put $50 in, okay? Into the pot or this collection of chips where all the winnings go, okay, the potential winnings. So then it goes clockwise to this player right here who then has to decide based on the strength of his hand if his hand is capable of winning overall and they will wanna make a bet, okay? Or they'll wanna fold or they'll wanna go all in or they'll even raise uh, the pre-existing bet. Now, had, let's go back for a second, My, I'm sorry. This player also has a check option. If you check, what you're, do, what you're essentially telling the table is, I don't wanna make a bet right now, I simply wanna pass my, my betting option to the player to my left. So if this player checks, and this player checks, then this player is left with the first option, and if they check as well, that's three checks around the table, that would be the end of the round. Okay, so let's go ahead, for simplicity's sake, let's just go ahead and say that instead of the, this player making that $50 bet, they check, player two checks, 
and then player three checks. So this gives you a good idea of what a checked round looks like. So no more, no new money is added to the pot, and we simply are left with these three players still in the hand. Now, the next thing is the dealer is gonna burn another card, okay, removing the top card from the deck, and there, this is the next round, this is the third round, and this is the turn round. So this fourth card is collectively known as the turn card, okay? Now again, it gets added to the collective pool, so what we're looking at here in this example is you see clearly there are two eights on the board. So when I get into the hierarchy of hands, I'll explain this, but I'm gonna tell you right now, this means that every player still playing will have at least a pair of eights towards the end of the round. The bad news is everybody has a pair of eights. So the player who happens to be holding that third or fourth eight in their hand is really in a great actionable position, all right? So let's say for, for now, again, we go around in a, uh, through a series of bets. Now let's just say for sake of argument, this player right here is holding another eight. So they're gonna go crazy and they're gonna bet $100, all right? And then this player right here is gonna think, oh my gosh, they clearly have a good hand. I'm gonna fold my hand. But this player here thinks they have a good hand as well. So they're gonna call that $100 bet and it gets put into the pot. So now we have, you know, collectively, $350 in the, in the pot. Now, once the money is good, both players have bet the same amount, we then go to the fourth round, which is the last time that we'll be adding any cards to the collective pool. So again, the dealer is gonna burn a top card and reveal this last, what's known as the river card. The river card is the last card that'll be added to the collective pool. So you see here, this two of hearts is not really gonna help anything. Um, so for simplicity's sake, we're gonna say that this player checks, this player checks, and then we move to the fifth and final round of any game of Texas Hold'em, which is known collectively as the showdown. In the showdown, the player who is directly to the left of the dealer, who's still in the hand, has to reveal their hand first. So this player is gonna reveal that they're holding uh, nothing, essentially, just a six and a four. So they were bluffing in the sake of playing off that they had maybe matched that eight. So here we have, they have a pair of eights with an ace, a jack, and a six. In this player right here, the last player in the hand has to either reveal their hand in order to take the pot and, and take all the winnings, revealing that they have a stronger hand, or they at the last minute can simply fold their hand away and not reveal uh, their hand. Only reveal your hand if, if you were trying to win, all right? Don't show your hand uh, to anybody for any reason. A lot of times, a lot of players, they have this, uh, this feeling like they wanna show that they had a good hand. It's irrelevant. Only show your hand to win. Never give away free information. Um, if you, people wanna see your cards, they need to pay for it, okay? That's my general piece of advice for you. So after that, we reveal the, this player folds their hand and this player over here in the example has won the pot. So just for a sake of um, review, again, the, the five rounds of every game of Texas Hold'em are the blind round, the flop round, the turn round, the river round, and finally the fifth round, which is the showdown. So that, con that concludes my brief introduction to the five phases that make up every hand of Texas Hold'em. So the third thing I'd like to talk about today uh, is the hierarchy of hands. It's very important to know the hierarchy of hands because you need to know what beats what. Um, and you need to know if you're holding a winning hand or simply a mediocre hand. Now, the worst hand you can possibly hold in poker is simply called high card, all right? So out of your five cards, none of them match, none of the suits match, um, and in reality, all you're left with in this particular example is queen high. So in a high card situation, the player who has the highest ranked card, ace of course being the, uh, the highest valued, um, beating out the king, would win this particular hand, okay? So this is, a re this is the weakest hand in poker, um, and literally you will always have at least high card, okay? There's never, uh, there's no such thing as a worse hand, but high card, a queen high is not a great hand, but it's certainly a winning hand if the player, the other players only have jack high, for example. The next best hand is simply a pair. So 
five cards, and if you have one set of cards that are matching, so in, case, in this example we have two threes, okay, that pair, that is a pair of cards, okay, the seven, the six, and the queen of hearts does nothing here. So what you have here is a pair of threes. Now, if you have two players, each with a pair, the player that has the better pair wins. So if anyone, uh, if you, for this example, if you revealed that you had a pair of threes, if any player had a pair of fours, fives, sixes, queens, whatever, they would beat you. The only thing that you beat is a pair of twos. Now, in the unlikely event that another player has the exact same as you, they both have a pair of threes, then it goes then to the next highest card, which, uh, again, is a queen. So, for example, if you went up against a player who had a pair of threes, and so did you, but you have the queen kicker, and they only have a jack, you'd be the winner. The next highest hand, uh, and actually pretty much where you can consider your hands to be strong, is two pair. Okay, this is the first hand that should honestly be considered a good hand. Uh, two pair is not great, because obviously there's lots of different uh, card combinations that beat it, but it is a decent hand, okay? Um, it does win fair, a fair number of hands uh, in Texas Hold'em. So in this example that I've provided you here, we have a pair of twos and a pair of aces. Now remember, ace is the highest, uh, the highest value in a, hand, in a standard deck of cards, okay, for poker. So this player has revealed two pair, pair two, pair of aces, and like I said before, it goes to whatever player has the highest pair. So if another player has two pair, but they don't have a pair of aces, you have won because you have a pair of aces. Even if they have a pair of kings and a pair of tens, your pair of aces and pair of twos beats their two pair because aces are the highest ranked hand you can possibly have. In the incredibly unlikely event that two players have the same two pair, then it goes to whatever player has the better um, a high card, which in this case, this player has revealed they have a seven high kicker card. The kicker card is the card that doesn't match with anything else. It simply exists to break ties. That's why we, uh, we call it the kicker card. Um, so that's just a little bit of nomenclature for you. All right. So the, the next highest hand, which is where things get really interesting, in my opinion, is the three of kind. Okay, the three of a kind, you have three cards that all share the same value. Okay, in this example, we have three fives. Okay, so five of diamonds, five of hearts, five of clubs. And then your two kicker cards are ace and two in this example. Now, with like all hands, if you have three of a kind and another player has three of a kind, then it goes to whichever player has the higher ranked three of a kind. Now, after three of a kind, this is where things get a little bit interesting because what we have is called a straight. Now a straight can be formed by any five cards that form a series. And by series, I mean a numerical counting series, three, four, five, six, seven in this case. It, doesn't not, it does not necessarily need to be three, four, five, six, seven. It could be four, five, six, seven, eight. It could be uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It could be any combination of five cards that form a numerical sequence, okay? It does, and they don't need to be the same suit. Uh, sorry, the same, uh, yeah, same, same suit. They simply need to be uh, a numerical sequence, okay? If two players both have straights, Whichever player has the higher straight or the straight that goes higher in the series wins. So obviously an ace high straight is the highest straight you could possibly hold. What's important to know about straights though, and this is, very, this is a very important rule, is that ace is not only the highest valued card, but it also can double as the lowest valued card. Because what you can do is you can have a five high straight which would go ace, two, three, four, and five. It's, it's for some people, this is kind of a confusing element, so um, hopefully I made that rather clear. But yes, uh, you can have ace, two, three, four, five, that would be a straight, but you could also have 10, jack, queen, king, ace. So both would be straights, but the ace high straight would be the high hand, why the five high straight would simply lose to an ace high straight. What's important to know is why a straight is a very, very, very good hand. It still can be beaten rather easily, actually. 
by what's collectively known as a flush. Now a flush is when you have five cards that all share the same suit. In this case, diamonds. It's irrelevant if the cards uh, are all over the place because we have a three, a four, a six, eight, and a jack. What's only thing that's important is that you all have the same suit, okay? Um, obviously, there are only 13 uh, diamonds in the deck, so that's why the flush is considered a higher valued hand than a straight, which can be made up of any suit, all right? So it's a little bit more difficult. But I don't want you to get too excited if you're holding a flush because there is a hand, a couple of hands that could still beat it. While they're unlikely that you that the that they occur, they are out there and you need to be aware of them. So the next highest hand is collectively known as a full house. And I'm not talking about that 1980s uh, TV show with uh, the Olsen twins. No, I'm talking about Three of a kind and two of a kind, okay? That's what a full house is. So we already talked about a pair and we've already talked about three of a kind, okay? But if you, if you have somehow put together a hand where you have a three of a kind and a two of a kind, uh, a pair and three of a kind, then you have what's collectively known as a full house. Now, in the unlikely event that two players reveal a full house, then it goes to whichever player has the higher ranked three of a kind, okay? So if, for example, I have three eights and the other player has three nines, then I have lost the hand, even though I have a pair of kings over here and they might have like a pair of twos. What the important thing is, is ties in cases of full houses, like I said, go first compared to the three of a kind. Now, again, if uh, both players somehow have the same, have a full house and both players have the same three of a kind, then it goes to uh, the two cards here, um, the pair. If both players have the exact same hand, then what happens is it's a split pot where both players have to split the, the pile of, of uh, chips. So for example, if there were $400 in the middle of the table, both players would take 200 instead of one player simply taking it all. Now, the full house, it's a great hand. You get super excited when you get it. But it, believe it or not, it's still not the best hand you could possibly hold. There are better hands. And those hands are known as the four of a kind, all right? Four of a kind is pretty self-explanatory. It's when you have four cards that all share the same rank, okay? So you have all four nines in the deck because of course there are only four. There's diamonds, clubs, hearts, and spades, and you have all four of them, okay? But believe it or not, even as difficult as it is to make a four of a kind, there is still one hand that can beat that, all right? And in my entire life of playing poker, in the thousand plus hands of poker I've, I've, I've played over the years, thousands of hands of poker, I have only received this hand once. And it is known as the straight flush. Now, the straight flush is a combination of a straight and a flush. It is both a numerical sequence and five cards all sharing the same rank. Sorry, the same uh, suit, rather. So this example that I provided is the highest ranked hand that you could possibly hold in the game of poker because this is collectively known as a royal flush. And the reason we call it a royal flush is because we have the jack, the queen, the king, and the ace, and the ten, all together, and this forms the, the royal flush. It beats every hand in poker, hands down, cannot be beaten. Can so let's just go over those hands one more time so you know the hierarchy. At the bottom of the list is the high card, followed by the pair, then two pair, then three of a kind, the straight, the flush, the full house, four of a kind, and finally the straight flush and the highest hand, of course, being the Royal Flush. In order to give you a more clear uh, tutorial in this, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead through one round of uh, Texas Hold'em, where the blind cards are actually face up the entire time. Now, obviously, these cards would be a secret to the respective players, but for the sake of this example, um, I will show you how 
you go about making a poker hand as the, each round of Texas Hold'em uh, progresses, okay? So I'm gonna say there are five players, okay? I'm gonna deal five cards out, okay? So we have this player with an ace of diamonds, eight of clubs, three of hearts, nine of diamonds, and a three of diamonds, okay? And then I'm gonna give them a second card. Now, remember, these cards would be secret, okay? They would be face down, and only the respective players would know what they are, okay? So just keep that in mind, okay? So, uh, overall, at this phase of the game, as I've, as I've described, the player with the aces have the best hands. That's because they have high card. So this ace six, currently, is the best hand at the table, okay? Nobody has paired anything, um, and nobody really has any great hands to speak of, okay? These are very much uh, hands that need some help, all right? So then the dealer burns the top card, reveals three cards which form a flop. Now, when this flop happens, these three cards form a community pool of cards that all players are free to use to make their best hand. So now you have at least five cards. So this player over here would have a pair of aces. This player over here would have ace high. This player over here would have a pair of aces. With, uh, and this player over here would have a pair of nines. And this player over here would actually have a pretty good straight draw going because we have ace, two, three, four. So this player right here, right now, is definitely uh, thinking they have a chance of getting a nice straight draw, but of course this is a bit of a gut check, okay? This is a bit of gambling because now you're hoping that the next two, there's only gonna be two more cards coming out this game and you're hoping that one of them is going to be a five, all right? I'm telling you straight up, don't go chasing straights. You're gonna lose a lot of money chasing straights. Um, if it works out for you, do it. All right, like if you, if, if for example, this had been ace, four, and five, and you already have a straight, that's great. But ultimately, uh, don't go chasing after straights, flushes either. Um, you'll, you'll end up losing more money than you think, all right? So then all these players go around betting as normal, and then we go ahead and reveal another card, okay? So now we revealed three spades. So any player who had two spades would be having a flush right now, not, not the case in this particular hand, but we did reveal that five, and that was not an accident, or that was not on purpose, that was purely by accident. I was just doing this demonstration. So, <laughs> I know I told you don't go chasing after straights, but this player has somehow pulled off a straight. The only problem was, is if I was this player right here, I would be really afraid, because there are three spades currently in the community pool, which means any player that was dealt two spades uh, is sitting on a flush. And as described earlier, a flush beats a straight. So remember, as good, of, as good a hand as a straight is, it can be beaten. So don't, don't uh, rely too much on that. Now, they're gonna go around, we burn another card, we reveal the fifth and final community card in the pool, all right? So now, during the showdown, every player is going to build the best hand they can from the two cards they were dealt at the beginning and the five cards in the middle of the pool. You don't touch these cards ever, okay? These cards you don't touch, only the dealer can touch them, all right? But we have here, this player has a pair of aces um, with a nine, eight, six kicker, not so good. This player right here has a pair of eights uh, with a ace, nine, five kicker, not very good. This player has a pair of aces, ace and ace, with a nine, eight, five kicker. Uh, I so they're, tie they're tied, essentially, with this player. Uh, actually, this player had a six kicker, so that's slightly better. This player over here has a pair of nines, okay? They almost had a straight, though. That's, that's to be, that's to be uh, pointed out. They did have nine, eight, seven, five. They're missing a six, so they can't form a straight from that. And then this player over here has the five high straight, ace, two, three, four, five. So in this particular example, this player right here has pulled off a hand. Now, what's important for me to, to mention is that this player right here pulled off a straight in the turn round, which means they had an entire round to milk the table for chips. Okay, if you know you have a great hand, 
bet heavy. Go ahead and bet heavy. But be intelligent enough to know what can still beat your hand, okay? So this player right here would have saw those three spades and knowing they had a straight, they would be like, hmm, somebody could have a flush and there are five players playing this hand. So that does not bode very well to me. But what's important to consider is the math. Always be considerate of the math. Remember, there are only 13 spades in the deck, all right? And this player right here was dealt one of them. He has the two of spades. So you know, if you're holding a straight and you're afraid of being beaten by a flush, if you're holding one of the cards that's required to make that flush, that means the odds of somebody else having two other spades is that much more lower, all right? So in reality, there are, you know, you know for a fact that four of the spades have already been dealt. So that only leaves another nine more spades in the deck. Another interesting thing here, of course, is even though he had a straight, which is a good hand, there was still one more card to be dealt. So if this last card had been a spade, then he would have actually had a, a flush. But what's important to know is that his card was a two, which is not very good. That will get beaten every day of the week uh, by another flush hand. So it was a bit of a gamble there. But yeah, this is an interesting example and I'm glad we did it. The last thing I wanna leave you with is an idea about bluffing, okay? So there's no rule in poker that you have to be honest with anybody. You can lie through your teeth, okay? You can constantly be lying about everything. How strong your hand is, how weak your hand is. You can portray so much information, both verbally and non-verbally. Now, some people like to run their mouth at the table. Other people like to be stoic and not say a word. A lot of people even wear sunglasses not to give away anything out of their eyes. Be mindful of the potential that you might have a tell, though. A tell, if you don't know what it, that is, is some habit, some non-specific uh, thing you do that reveals to everybody else that you're lying. You might scratch your head, you might touch your lips, you might scratch your nose, you might tug your ear, you might tap uncontrollably. There are a million different ways to identify a tell. So identifying other people's tells and knowing how you have developed tells is very important. So when practicing at Texas Hold'em, it's important that you uh, maybe have some friends at the table who help you develop as a player and maybe reveal to you um, that you have this glaring tell that everyone can read, okay? You, you wanna be very deceptive. You don't wanna give away any information. Um, that's why many people prefer online poker play versus, uh, versus live per, uh, tournament play because when you play online, obviously, there are there is no exposure that you have with the other players. They simply are an avatar on the screen with a stack of chips and you really don't know who they are or what they're doing, what they're thinking. While if you were face to face with that person, you could be reading their face or their body language, or you could be very well listening to what they're saying and uh, how they're shuffling their chips, how nervously they made that bet. There's a number of, of different um, ways and things that you could, you could pick up. Um, there, are, there are many different sources out there that will give you an idea of how to identify tells. We're planning on doing a video in the future about how to specifically identify some tells and common tells that people might give you. Um, but for the most part, it's an inexact science, all right? So kind of trust your gut uh, and your years of experience. You know, you gotta play a whole lot of hands with a whole lot of different people before you really get an indication of how to read people effectively. Um, and the last thing I wanna lead you, leave you at is there are people out there who specifically give misinformation on purpose. They'll convince you that they're bluffing when in fact they're holding the winning hand. And you really wanna be careful that you don't get sucked in, which is uh, you know, an expression meaning you are tricked into pushing chips forward under false pretenses, all right? Don't get sucked in, whatever you do. Always be aware of your outs, the cards that you still need to win or improve your hand, and be aware of what potential hands are out there that, can, that could beat your hand, even if it's a strong one uh, inherently.
okay? Understand the math and you'll never go wrong. Thanks for watching to the end. Uh, make sure to check out the rest of the videos we have on the channel. We have a whole lot of great tutorials, including beginner's guides and more advanced tutorials for players who've moved past those beginning stages in their learning. Um, guys, if you could help by leaving a comment down below, that would help us really grow the channel. Um, go ahead and clicky clack that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, so that way you'll be made sure to get all of our updates um, and it will show us that you are a fan of the show. Um, guys, I'm Dominic. This is the All American Casino Guide reminding you to play responsibly. Okay. Daryl Nelson uh, said, The secret to winning at slots is this. Buy one and get other people to put their money in your slot machine. It's that simple. You know what, uh, Daryl? I think that's a great idea. Um, I think that anyone who's ever owned uh, some slot machines will tell you that they, they generate money. They wouldn't exist if they didn't. Uh, Giddy Gold asked, uh, what's this in German? Westo S de Uberschift in Deutsch, English quant. Well, that's in German. What am I supposed to do with that?